Good morning. <coughs> Has anyone here ever gotten lost while driving? Yes. <laughs> yes. I admit, I have like no man sense of direction, but let me ask you this. Have you ever gotten lost driving at nighttime? Yes. That is horrible. You know, there was this time when I first got my license, I was 16 years old, and I was driving back from somewhere I didn't know the direction to, and you know, we didn't have smartphones back then with Google telling you to turn left here, dummy, and, and things like that. And so. I didn't have that, and so I remember one night I was driving, and I got lost. And I was driving, and have you ever gotten lost where nothing was around? No buildings, no street lights, no houses. I remember I was six years old, I was driving, and I was driving, and I didn't know, not know where I was, and it was dark. And I got afraid. And so I would take a turn here, and I would take a turn there. And everywhere I was going, I was getting even more lost. And it was dark. There was no stars in the sky because of cloud cover. It was like pitch black. Have you ever been in pitch black in a car? Nothing around. And the whole time I was afraid, and I was just saying, God, please help me. Because I do not know where I am going. And so I thought, I don't have a way to call my parents. I don't see a house for me to just stop and ask for directions. And so I finally made the decision, Micah, just drive until you see some light. Because it was pitch black. All I had were my headlights. And so I drove for a while, and I was driving, and then I finally saw this really ultra-dim light. And I could barely see this light. I could barely see it glow, but I still decided, you know what? Nothing's around. No one is around. I'm in complete darkness, not even the moonlight or the stars. I'm just going to head to this little light. And so I drove and I drove. And I finally drove up, and it was this little mini mart out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and they, they didn't even sell gas. And so I went in there, and I was finally able to get directions. And, the, and, uh, and I was finally able to get back onto an interstate and get home. And then I thought about that for a moment, and I thought, that's what it feels like to be in utter darkness. But the one thing that seemed to have saved me and given me a direction back home was this very dim light. All it took was this dim light, and the only thing that I could think of was, this darkness is scary, but the only thing I'm going to do is, if I can find some light, I'm going to head in that direction. You know, that's kind of how we go about our life. Even if we're sometimes Christians, sometimes people feel like they're living their lives in darkness and then no matter what turn they're taking, whether it be left or right or if they're going straight, they just seem like there's darkness all around, no, no sun, no stars, no moonlight, just them in utter darkness. And they feel like no matter what decision I make in life, if I take a left or a right, I'm still wandering in darkness. What do I do? How do I get home? How do I go about life? And so often we get so overwhelmed and stressed and exhausted and tired and fearful that we just say, what do I do? And sometimes in those moments I think about that and I try, try to remind people, look for that little bit of light. If your whole life feels like you're just surrounded in confusion and in darkness and lostness and so forth, you just, just take a moment and say, I need to find that light. Now, what is that light? You know, in Psalm 119, it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. You know, that's one of the things I often tell people is if you feel like you're wandering in darkness, even if you've been a Christian, for a long time. If you feel like you're walking aimlessly, don't know where to turn, don't know what to do, don't know how to act, don't know how to, don't know how to do any of these things, look for that light and walk towards it. 
And that's one of the things that we're going to be doing over the next uh, couple months. Is we're going to be walking through Psalm 119. And we're going to be walking through this chapter because this is one of the things I want us to understand is I want us to be able to walk in this world of darkness being guided by the light. No matter how dim that light may look at times because of how dark the world can be, that light is enough to get you home and to lead you where you need to be led. And so one of the things that people often ask is they ask, is the word of God still relevant? Does it make a difference? Is it powerful? Can it actually do something in my life? And the answer is yes. But only if you're willing to listen to it, obey it, and live it. It's not enough just to hear it. It's not enough just to believe a few things from it. It's that idea that says, you know what, I have no other direction than to hear head through that little light up above. And the funny thing is, as I drove closer to that light, the light got bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where I finally got to a location where I could finally get directions to go home. So if you need some direction in your life, we need to walk in accordance with God's word. Now, why do we want to walk through this chapter? Well, one of the things about this is Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. Did you know that? Psalm 119 is the biggest chapter in the Bible. And here's the interesting thing. When God says something, and he says it over and over and over again, you know that it's important. And so... If, if you're saying, God, what's important to you? What do you want humanity to know? What are you telling us time and time and time again? Well, one of the interesting things about Psalm 119 is that this is a chapter, the longest chapter in the whole Bible, and it's all about the Word of God. So think about this. The longest chapter in the Bible is about the Word of God. So what do you think God is telling us to to focus on God's word. How do we know God? His nature, his character. We know from nature that he exists, but how do we know his character? His word. We know that Jesus died on the cross, was buried, and rose again and grants eternal life. Where do we get that good news? The word. We talked about right and wrong and morality and righteousness and how do we walk in the way that God has called us to live and how Jesus walked. Where do we get that information? God's Word. You see, one of the things that God wants humanity to know is focus on God's Word, know it, desire it, love it, obey it. And one of the things about this book is that it's very poetic. One of the ways that we see Psalm 119 broken up is that you see these headings, and these headings are the Hebrew letters. There's 22 of them, and in, in the Hebrew letters, there's eight lines mentioned. And so it's a very poetic book, but this whole poetic chapter is really about God's Word. And in fact, scholars looked at this and said pretty much every verse, except for maybe a couple, really has pretty much a reference to God's Word or obeying it. God's word, or listening to God's word, or worshiping God because of God's word. He said in Psalm 119, almost every verse in that chapter has some relation or correlation with the fact that God's word is being emphasized. So think about that. The longest chapter in the Bible is about God's word. So what do you think God is telling us? Is the word of God important? It's the very thing. This is what I tell, told my small group last week, was telling them, the Word of God is the instrument that God has made known to humanity to help us to be changed and saved and to know Jesus. This is why God's Word is so important. Now why is, now why is God's Word so important? How can it give us direction? How can it give us instruction for us? I want you to think about this for a moment. You know, a lot of times in my ministry, you, 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 you get to know different kinds of people. And so one of the things that you do, and especially in a counseling kind of uh, training and situation, you, you understand different temperaments and personalities and things. But a lot of times, there are different people who are sometimes more logical people, and some people who are more emotional people by nature. Now, take a moment and think about this. Ask yourself, are you a more logical person by nature, or are you more of an emotional person by nature? And, and answer it. 
Now, God wired you that way for a purpose. There's not a necessarily bad or right or wrong in that. But let me tell you why the Word of God is so important. Because sometimes, from those who are very logical and thinking, sometimes we, we, we who think very logically, we can be so logical to the point where we're stupid. Right. You, you know? To the point where, you, have you ever overthought stuff? You know, one of the things that the Bible says is that the wisdom of man is foolishness. So no matter the smartest person in the world can sometimes be stupid. Have you ever read like PhD people, they'll, they'll say some of the stupidest things, some of the stupidest things I've ever heard are guys who are some of the most educated people in the world. You know? And, and I thought about this, you know, ever since I was young, I got tested with a high IQ, you know, and, and I got this and I thought, you know, compared to God, I'm stupid. You know? And to think, we celebrate, oh, look at this logic. So sometimes, for those who are logical, sometimes it's so easy to say, you know, this is what makes sense. This is what I think. This is what, you know, and we will rationalize things. You know, the Enlightenment, in that period was focusing on man's wisdom a little bit more sometimes than, you know, than God's wisdom. Well, who wins? But then, and so we understand, you know, the fortune of man I mean, the wisdom of man is foolishness. But those who are emotional, one of the things is if you base all your decisions on emotion, you're going to have some fallacies as well. You know, one of the things we, we say in counseling and marketing is you make your worst decisions when you're overly emotional. Whether you're overly tired, angry, sad, whatever, happy, you know, you, you make some of your worst decisions. You know, the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things. Do not trust it. Now, here's the thing why the Bible is so important. The Bible is important whether you're a logical thinker or whether you're an emotional feeler because one of the things that it does is it helps us to have the right mentality and perspective so that instead of finding our lives on man's wisdom, which is foolishness, for those who are logical, we actually understand what true wisdom is, that heavenly wisdom from God's word, and that tells us this is what's actually wise and this is what's actually true. And for those who are emotional, one of the things that it does is it helps us draw onto reality and say, you know what, emotion is not a bad thing. God is an emotional being. God created motion for a reason. Yet the emotion that we should feel should always first and foremost come from the perspective of who God is and what God says. Truth should influence our feelings more than anything else. And so one of the things that the Bible does, whether it's logical or emotional, is that it helps us have the logic of God and the truth that should give us an emotional response that God himself would have. That's why it's so important for us to have this idea of focusing our lives on the word of God. It's why it helps those who are logical draw into true logic, which is from God, and helps those who are emotional have true emotion that God himself would experience in that situation. And that's why the word of God, whether regardless of how you've been wired by God and you are fearfully and wonderfully made and God made you the way you are for a reason, and that's why the Bible is applicable no matter who you are or how you're wired, because it draws you into becoming more like God. And so Psalm 119 is a, a, a powerful one. And I like how Warren Wiersbe defined what, what the purpose of Psalm 119 is. He says, it describes how the word enables us to grow in holiness and handle the persecutions and pressures that always accompany an obedient walk of faith. You know, one of the things that we understand here is that the word of God really makes a difference when we finally choose to obey it. And you know, there are times when hardship and persecution are going to come. But do you obey it? Let me tell you this right now. And I try to tell this, and I've mentioned this to our life group at different times. I tell you, there are times when God's word will not make human logical sense to you. Do it anyways. There are times when the word of God will go against what you have emotionally feel or what you experienced in your life. Do it anyways. Because God is always right. And he says what he says for a reason, for your benefit, to help you. And this is how we get guided. People will say, well, I've been a Christian, but I still feel lost. 
But are you trying to seek God through his word and obeying that in love? You know, we don't obey God to make him obligated to save us. We obey God because we love him. And that's where Psalm 119 helps us to understand that there's this idea of hearing God's word and having an obedience of faith, an obedience of action, an obedience of love. And so one of the things that we're going to be doing is we're going to be going over the, through, through this book, and we're going to go through it, and we're not going to go do this in-depth analysis. I just want to keep it simple. I want to keep it simple and just pull some simple things just to give you an idea, and then I want you to go home, read these chapters, and then you do the in-depth analysis through your life and figure out, based on how my life situation, based off of my temperament, based off of my family, based off of my experiences, how can I take the biblical principles that God has made known in this powerful chapter and apply it to my life so that I'm walking a greater obedience of faith? And so let's look and want to see one of the things. We're going to use, throughout these sermons, we're going to see that we're called to do some things. And so one of the first things that the first uh, section of Psalm 119 does is it calls us to be blessed and blameless. Let's read that real quick. Psalm 119, verse 1 through 8. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, whose walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. So one of the things that I like getting from this passage is that there's two things that we really are called to do. One, be, be blessed, and two, be blameless. Now, how many of you want to be blessed? Raise your hand. Okay, some of you don't want to be blessed. I'll give you my best later today. Okay, but, but think about this. You, everyone wants to be blessed, but here's the thing. We've got to redefine what blessed means. You know? Because of culture, because of even some false preachers teaching like health and wealth gospel and things like that, we have this false idea of what blessed means. Because we have this idea of blessed means, okay, I'm happy, I have good health, I have money in the bench, I have a job that satisfies me, and people like me. That's how we really define being blessed. But you know what the interesting thing is? Jesus defines what blessed means. Have you noticed that the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount began with these blessings from Christ himself? And he would say things like, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so one of the things he's saying is, You're blessed when you're humble. What? But our culture says, Don't be humble. Be proud. Have everyone look at you. How many followers can you have? But one of the things that we understand is, Is there a blessing in that? You see, when we start seeing blessing from God's eyes rather than our own eyes, see, we take that human logic out of the equation. We take that human emotion out of the equation, and we let God's logic and God's emotion define what true blessing is. And so one of the things that we understand is we have to understand what blessing really looks like. Are we having the right perspective on what it means to be blessed? I tell people, everyone in this room is blessed. One, because you know Jesus and then even if by the world standards, we're more blessed than most people in the world. Literally. But then we're also called to be blameless. This doesn't necessarily mean absolutely perfect. The whole reason why we're part of worship service here is because we're going and we're confessing and saying, I need Jesus Christ to forgive me of my sin. We don't proclaim to be perfect. We proclaim to be redeemed. And that's a difference. And so one of the things that I want us to understand is that we're blessed. Now, I had this good illustration about being blessed, but then, I, then Bible class happened. Good job, Jason. And, and the good conversation happened. And I was just thinking about how the perspective of blessedness really is. And then Cheryl Chrysler got up. And, and, well, she didn't stand up, but she spoke up. Yeah, who I'm um, sure. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but one of the things that Cheryl did was she said, you know what? I did not choose to have cancer. But through it, I came to be still and know that he is God. And I knew God better than I had ever known God and in a way I had never experienced. And it took cancer for that to happen. Now, how many of you would say I was blessed because I had cancer? 
I thought about that and I'm just like, I remember when me and the elders went and we prayed with her and Mike, and after we left, the elders and I were like, we were there to encourage her and she encouraged us. And Mike encouraged us. And I was like, she's blessed because she, even if she went through a suffering that she would never ask for and probably doesn't want again, it did draw her into a state of relationship with God that she never understood before. And then she added on and we talked about a conversation her and I had the other week. And we talked about Terry and how, you know, caretaking is one of the hardest things to do in general, especially for a loved one, especially a spouse or a child. And she, she was faithful to Christ. She was attending worship services. She was still serving people. And I remember I would go and visit Terry, and, and we would have talks. And I would see Shirley doing her thing, and I would leave. And I would always pray for Shirley, and I'm saying, yeah, I'm praying for Terry, but I'm praying for Shirley because I see what she has to do for Terry. And so I prayed for her a lot. And I thought about that and how, you know, she didn't wish to be a caretaker of her husband and see him go through what he went through. But she understood Christ in a different way. And then, I, and then after hearing that conversation, I just start, started thinking about all these people who have been blessed. I thought about one of the conversations that I've been having more recently is with Dee, and I'm thinking, she's a superwoman. All the things she's doing in her life, and I get encouraged every time I get a message from her, and I'm just thinking, the only reason she does what she does is because she loves Jesus, and she encourages me. And so I'm like, press forward. I think about Val right here, you know? She posted online how she was in the hospital, but you know, right now she has a kidney stone right now, and she's still choosing to be here. Isn't that amazing? That young man, that good-looking guy there with that $100 million smile out there, got baptized into Christ. You know, he's going to change the world someday. He probably already is. I think about Jason and his class and seeing how much he's grown, and regardless of all the things that he's gone through, one of the things he said is in classes, you can run from God or you can run to God. True blessedness is helping us run towards God, and blamelessness is the life that God is trying to get you to lead. Here are some things that we can learn from this. We're just going to go through some of them pretty quickly. But if you break down, here are some of the things that he's calling you to do. And some facts. True blessing comes from living according to the Word of God. People often ask, well, how do I get blessed by God? And I'll ask people, are you doing what God says? Well, no then why would you expect God to bless you? Right? It's like your kids. They, dis they disobey you. They, they don't clean up after themselves. They won't do their homework. And then they say, hey, Mom, can I have this? And she's like, uh, did you do those things? Well, no. Well, why would you expect me to bless you? You see, obedience is part of the way that God seeks to bless you. And in fact, obedience is not just that... The, the reward of, of being blessed is not just the end result go, that you get from obedience, but the obedience, the process of obedience, in and of itself is a blessing because you're coming to know God and being like God. Another one is blameless living is equated with walking God's way. You want to know how to be blameless? Well, how did Jesus walk? How does the Bible tell me how to live? Is, is the Bible going to tell me to live in a way that's unpopular in the world? Yep. But walk it anyways. Because most people right now are still miserable. And they're walking the way of the world. Why would we want to walk that way? Makes no sense. Another one, seeking God with all your heart will lead you to obeying God's word. You know, if you, if you say, I want to love God, I want to worship God, I care about God, and you're singing all the songs that Tom's leading us in, and then you go out that door and you're not obeying God, are you really loving God? Are you really seeking him with all your heart? You know, remember when you fell in love, you sought out that person with all your heart. Love God that way. Because you would do anything for that person, and then you say, oh, I want to get married, and then you get married, and all that other stuff. You know, one of the things is, if you seek someone, your heart mandates you to take certain action. And the way to discover God's way is by knowing God's word. Here's the thing I tell people. Don't let your opinion, your feelings, your experience, your logic determine who God is or how God thinks or feels or what his way is. Let God do that himself through his word. Don't try to have your image of God that you want and have a relationship with that God. 
read that book, know who God really is by nature and character, and love him. Because who he really is is better than any God you can come up with. So know that God. Another one, shame comes from disobeying God's word. Think about this. What are you most ashamed of? Helping people? Worshiping Jesus? Or is it the wrong things you've done in your life? If you, you know, people aren't ashamed of doing the right things. They're ashamed of doing the wrong things. So if you don't want shame in your life, obey God's word. You know, true worship happens when you combine a right heart with an obedience of faith. If you really want to worship God in spirit and in truth, well, have the right heart and also live in accordance with that truth. That's the kind of worshiper Jesus said he is looking for. And the Word of God helps you keep a relationship with God. If you feel distant from God, if you don't feel His presence, and I tell people this too, just because you don't feel God's presence doesn't mean that He's not there. You want to know one of the things about what happens at baptism? What do you receive? The Holy Spirit. So He lives inside you, so no matter where you go, He's with you. So whether you feel it or not, remember, Satan is a good liar. He will manipulate your feelings into believing God's not there when he is. So don't listen to that liar. So another thing that we see here, and we'll go over this one pretty quickly, is a call to a pure and holy heart. So this is what the second section of Psalm 119 says. Let's read the next eight verses. It says, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise me to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. So one of the things that we're seeing here is we're called to have a pure and holy heart. And people often ask, well, how can a, a young person keep their way pure? And this isn't just talking about sensual purity, but that would include it. It's talking about purity in all aspects of your life, your holiness. If you look at your kids, don't you want your kids to walk in a holy way? And young people, right now, let me tell you this. As you get older, you're going to enter this age where you're going to have to find your own faith, find your own independence. You're going to be tempted with things that you are going to have more freedom to embrace if you choose to. But, and I encourage you, dwell on God's word and let it write, be written on your heart. Because if it's truly on your heart, it says, you know, right here, you know, it's on your heart. Don't let you stray from the commands. And you hide your word, his word in your heart so that you won't sin against him. You know, one of the things that God tries to do is he tries to save you from yourself by saving you from the sinfulness that you will be tempted to enjoy. Because it doesn't, sin doesn't leave you joyful. It brings shame. It brings consequences. It brings harm. And sometimes harm that will hurt you for years. And God's saying, I love you enough. I want to teach you the right way to live life. If you think about the people who have impacted your life the most, aren't they the ones who are trying to keep you on the right path? Whether it be a teacher, a coach, a parent, a, uh, an adult mentor. Are they telling you to do certain things and not to do certain things because they hate you or because they love you? Because they're saying, learn from the lessons and mistakes that I have made and be wise so that you don't have to go through learning the lessons I learned the hard way. Learn it the easy way, so that way your life is easier, so you can enjoy life better. God's way. You see, holiness is a blessing. I mean, think about this. Are you really ashamed for love, and joy, and peace, and patience, and kindness, and goodness? You see all those things? Those are the things that people say, I wish the world had more of that. Young people, if you want to change the world, you know, I know young people, and I appreciate young people wanting to change the world. The way to do it is by living a pure and holy life, by having God's Word written on your heart. That would make a greater difference than anything else. One of the great examples is Abigail Ward right there. I love how she writes cards to people, posts online, and one of the things that she does is she tries to spread God's kindness to the world. And Disney and I were having this conversation about how much we admired Abigail. And one of the, thought, the things I said was, you know, man's wisdom says that the greatest impact 
people are those who are powerful. You know, we're in this cycle where we're about to have another presidential election. There's this emphasis on the power. It doesn't matter what politician or what party, they're all bent on power. But I, I said, you know what? That young girl in view of eternity is going to make a greater difference with her kindness than someone with power. Why? Because God's word is that powerful. You know, I always think about how God's word is so powerful. One of my favorite passages is from Isaiah, where he says, your ways are not my ways. And then he goes on and says, when your word goes forth, it never comes back void. It always makes a difference. And so think about this. The word of God always makes a difference. And you young people especially have it written on your heart. Imagine how everything you do, living a holy and godly and pure life because the word is sown into your heart. Imagine how everything you do in the name of Christ will never come back void. That's why God can change the world through people like you. And he has proven it time and time again. The people who change the world are those who live pure and holy lives. Open up the Bible, Old Testament through New Testament. You see, the ones who really change the world and view of eternity live pure and holy lives. They live that blameless life. They live that obedient life. And the people who really changed the world were those who said, God, I don't understand everything that you're telling me. I don't, under, I don't feel it, but I will obey you anyways. Think about Abraham and Job and David and Elijah and Moses. They didn't have the blessings of an easy life, but they were blameless and obedient and holy. Were they perfect? No, but they did try to walk in the ways of God. If you have had been bogged down because of sin in your life, the only solution is to have God's will written on your heart so that you don't sin any longer. That's why the message of repentance is one of the most preached messages in the Bible. And so one of the things is, how do we do this? One of the things is realize the answer to having a pure life is the Word of God. People say, well, I've been a Christian a long time. How come my life's not improving? Well, how much time are you spending in the Word of God? Well, not much. Well, there's your answer. I, I can only influence you so much in a half an hour in a week. But what you do with your time in God's word alone, when no one is watching, is going to have greater benefits than what I'm doing up here for you right now. Why? Because that's when you're letting God's word sown into your life and you obey. Seeking God with all your heart and biblical obedience uh, work together. They don't, if you read the Bible, they don't, they're never separate. Seeking God with all your heart and obeying God's word are never separate things. Because if you're seeking God, what would, what would you do? You do what the Bible says to lead you to him. That makes sense. The word of God helps you not to sin and help you become like God. Think about this. Why do we want sin? Why would you want the very thing that you asked Jesus to wash your sins away for when you went into that water? Think about that. And we think about your marriage. Is your marriage blessed? When holiness exists or when sin exists? The holiness. Because sin always has negative consequences. Sin always ruins relationships. So one of the things God is trying to do is saying, I want you to have less sin in your life because it will ruin your life, it will ruin your relationships, it will ruin your peace. So get rid of it. True worship requires desiring God's word. How many of you say, I hunger and thirst for this word? How many of you say, I want to hear what God has to say? You know what? So many people are so bent on having people hear what they think. And sometimes I get caught in that. I like people caring about my opinion at times. But then I take a moment and say, oh yeah, the wisdom of man is foolishness. So what I think really doesn't matter. But what does God have to say? You know, Jason made a good point in class today. He says, hey, Mike is a pretty good preacher, but I think he uses a good source material. Well, I'm not a good preacher. God's just good at writing a Bible. Right? So that's what we really want to do is focus on God's Word in that regard. The Word of God is a valuable treasure given to you by God himself. Have you ever imagined this for a moment? How many of you like receiving a gift at Christmas or birthday or anniversary or whatever? Can you, I want you to take an image and just imagine God giving a wrapped gift and then you opening it up. And it's his word. 
But it says, that's every love letter I've written to you. It's every piece of fatherly advice that you would long for a father to give. It's a way to heaven and that ticket into eternal life. When you, when you see it from that perspective, you're like, that's the greatest gift ever. Why? Because it tells me about Jesus, who was given by God to save us from our sins. Loving God requires a sincere love for God's Word. Let me tell you this, you cannot love God if you don't love God's Word. Now people will think, is that really true? Yes, it is true. Because what he says comes from his heart, and what his heart is, is who he is by character and nature. So if you want to love God, you have to love his word. Because it's his word that makes known, this is who I am. This is what I think. This is what I feel. This is what I believe, and this is what truth is. And so if you really want to love God, you have to love God's word. But Michael, what if I disagree with it? What if I don't understand it? What if I don't want to do it? I don't think... God's helping you know him. And he wants you to live the best life possible, which is not this, you know, secular, material blessing. It's the blessings that you're going to enjoy for eternity. The greatest blessings. And then another one is take time to meditate on God's word and help you be changed by it. You know, I love how Cheryl said, we live in a world that keeps us so busy that we don't learn to be still and know that he is God. I appreciate that comment today, Cheryl, by the way. And I thought, as I get older, I've always been a very active, gung-ho, motivated, ambitious kind of person. But the older I get every year, I stop doing so much and focus on letting God work. And I take time to just dwell and grow in meditation and desiring God more. Because me meditating on God and His Word and allowing that Word to change my life is greater than any possible action I could ever do by my own power. And that's how we change. That's how we grow. When we hear God's Word, meditate on it, and say, how can I have this change my life? And when you do that, God purifies you in the process. This is the refining fire that takes this clump of earth and makes it into a beautiful piece of jewelry. That's what God is doing with you through that word. That's why Ephesians 5 talks about, you know, being sanctified and washed with the word. And so one of the things that I want you to understand is God is calling you to a blessed life. But his version of blessed. He's calling you to live a blameless life. Not necessarily a perfect, but in his direction, and he will help you. He'll be that little light in that world of darkness, and he will guide you. And he's calling you to be pure and holy, because sin destroys. It doesn't bring peace, it doesn't bring joy, it doesn't bring glory. But he wants you to know him and say, I am done with sin, I choose holiness. So as we go through this series, I hope that you will make the decision that we want to hear God speak. And we want to meditate on his words and truly know him and to live according to his word and his way rather than my way and my opinion. And when we do that, you will see that little light in the darkness and you will be guided home. If today you want to know that you're being led in the right way and you want to follow Jesus who is the way, the truth, and the life, and you want to accept his eternal gift of salvation, leading you home to heaven and eternity one day. We give you the opportunity as we're about to stand and sing to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sin, confessing your faith. So we offer you that invitation now as we stand and sing.